we see that. Good morning, everyone. State Superintendent Elsie Arnson here. I'm here at the table with our CFO and Mr. Kirksey. HR is, is just departing, so he's leaving in just a second and he'll be here. So thank you all for being part of our education advocates today. We um, have a bright agenda that we are going to be going through today with possibly some um, questions that we might have. Um, we have uh, Esther and Ian's update with uh, Wendy Fawns. And just as a, a note, since I have um, our CFO here, we have a date that's looming to make sure that Esther 1 is completed. That was $41 million. It had a different look than um, Esther to or anything dealing with the ARP monies that came through. Then we have a discussion because we submitted a lot of data and are very proud of our schools for uh, completing this new data um, collection that the federal government had required. So we have a little bit of information on that. Um, Mr. Phillips and Victoria, um, who we hired to understand broadband. And they will share a little bit of what happened with uh, the emergency relief dollars that came from Congress, but also with some infrastructure dollars that Montana will be embracing either between, if you can hear me, 300 million to 500 million. They are uh, Department of Administration is working through a plan that they will submit to the federal government. And when the federal government um, uh, gives their okay on the plan, that's when we will know how much of that 300 to 500 million for broadband build out Montana will receive. Education was written into the federal law and we wanna make sure that we are with our partners of you are at the table. Then Dr. Mergel will be doing chapter 55. I see McCall on the Board of Public Ed is on. Thank you for your partnership as we work and do the heavy lifting together on chapter 55 accreditation, as well as chapter 58, which is student prep preparation programs with our 10 teacher prep programs across our state. And then um, Megan Peel with DPHHS was very humble and wanted to be part of our meeting today. I do have some information to share. She could not attend today, but this is something that um, a universal, a mental health universal screening tool that uh, they have, I believe, come to an RFP and have picked a, um, an opportunity that will be a program, a grant program through DPHHS to be able to understand the continuum of care in mental health. So yes, to screen, but also then to understand after student or family is recognized in that screening program to then say, what is the next step? Because you just can't say that there's a problem without a partnering of a solution. So we'll go ahead and begin. Wendy, welcome, good morning. We'll let you go ahead. And if you have anything to share on your screen, please do. Okay, thank you for that introduction. And um, yes, this month we're doing a lot of spend down with ESSER 1 and also the data collection piece that we have been doing to resubmit to the federal government. That went really well. We were able to upload all the information. We really appreciate all the districts working with us to 
be able to get that resubmission. There were just a few items with identification of numbers, the UEIs and the DUNS, um, those had to be corrected on a couple. And we really appreciate all the districts working with us to get those numbers accurate and to be able to upload that successfully um, without any consistency errors. So again, we appreciate that. We are doing it, it looks like I'm not able to share screens, but we are doing this week um, a significant number of additional trainings that follow the format that we used on August 9th. And that um, training is gonna start with allowable use of funds, then follow with amendments and cash requests. So we sent out about 1600 notifications on that. We've gotten a, a heavy pull on people who are attending. We'll continue those in October as well. But um, those should be going out today. We will be recording those. They will be up on our website just as the August 9th are on our website as well. So we hope to see some of you at those um, training sessions later on this week, starting with uh, just in a couple of hours. So thank you so much, Superintendent. It, um, I think that's where we stand on the on the ESSER and the uh, EANS programming at this point. Thank you. And as we have always done, reflections will follow. So I apologize that you couldn't share your screen, but we'll go ahead and we'll send that uh, acknowledgement of the four opportunities uh, to be able to attend and uh, really understand. We had a giggle at our table today uh, when we were discussing uh, Esther and Ian's this morning, as we do every Tuesday morning, about the amendments that are occurring with not just Esser 1, but Esser 2 <laughs> and Esser 3. And Wendy, if you want to just share about um, the, the transparency, as well as the flexibility that we offer at the state for districts and clerks to be able to recognize a better use of the dollars. So those funds, one of the unusual and, and very beneficial uh, things with regards to the ESSER grant is the avail availability to amend um, what you thought you were going to use the funds for. So when those funds came in the early pandemic days, it was thinking we were gonna use them for one thing and now using the amendments process, you are able to update that funding allocation and that's a real benefit. So we are working with um, districts, just as you decide that you want to spend the funds differently, there's not a, a, a difficult process to do that. You can just submit a request through eGrants, and then we can go ahead and process those changes. So um, definitely keep that in mind going forward, that the plans that you may have initiated two years ago for the use of the funds, or even a year ago for the use of those funds, mm -hmm. as you move forward, you can make changes and reallocate those funds into a different use category. And um, that's a process that is pretty straightforward. We do have a template that we're using now and we've shared that out, but feel free to reach out to both Rebecca and I if you have any questions about how to do those amendments, how to do changes in funding cycles. Thank you, Wendy. And I mean, the giggle was that there's been thousands of amendments, which is, I think, um, an exciting part of what we get to do added on top of the normal uh, requests that we have with any general fund dollars or any of the federal monies that flow like Title I or through nutrition. So it's just been a very busy time and we'll continue to do so. The other thing that I want to add is that there are ESSER plans that are, are done twice a year. And Can the next one will be- list of all of those? The next one will be at the close of this school year. Um, I mean, at the calendar year, it will be done at the calendar year. And so if updates are happening with amendments, just want to remind everyone, and we will then on our monthly, uh, we do a uh, monthly report that is on our website of all school districts on their drawdowns and their allocations as well. And I'm going to move that on over to you. Uh, then, Jay, if you could just speak to that um, that uh, report that goes to our school trustees as well as superintendents and clerks, as well as the immediacy of ESSER 1. Yeah, thanks, Superintendent. So um, as Superintendent spoke, we, we actually got two different types of reports that OPI is gonna start providing. The first one is out on our website. We have, it's an ESSER update. We get a fair amount of questions, whether it's you know from the field or even internally or even from reporters, about how school districts are utilizing those funds. And so what we've, what we've created is a report that shows by each one of what they call a purpose category. So if a school had budgeted, let's say for uh, like technology, uh, they could, uh, it'll reflect in their budget that they have that and then what amount they expended for that, that specific purpose category. 
Um, thank you, Brian, for putting that up. So on the, the first page that you'll see is it's going to be an update of ESSER 1, 2, and 3 collectively for at the state level. Now, the amounts you're looking here, we'll see it, it will reflect both the administrative piece that OPI retained to, to run the program, but then also that flow through component that goes out directly to the districts. And so this one, you can see it's, it's a little bit, uh, we've had some other, other activities. So actually for ESSER 1, we're down to about $1.6 million. We're about 96% expended. But at the front facing of this report each month, um, you can go out there and you can see where we are for the state of Montana and how OPI and the school districts are utilizing those funds. And so, Brian, if you can scroll down to the next page, that'd be great. Okay. And so then, as I had mentioned, that in the report, it'll show by each one of the schools um, what they were actually allocated by each one of the funding pots, so ESSER 1, ESSER 2 consolidated, and ESSER 3 consolidated. Um, ESSER 1, you will notice under that use of funds, that it does have a blank category. Um, part of the reason for that is, is that when Montana received the ESSER dollars, Department of Education did not really give us clear guidance as the type of reporting categories that they would like. And so we didn't go down to the same levels we did with two and three. Um, but with ESSER two and three, we actually, when they did their budgets, we had them put it into specific categories. And then when they did their drawdowns for the, the cash request to get reimbursed, they also had to identify those categories as well. And so again, that kind of gives you just a sense with if you want to go look at one specific school of how they've budgeted and how they've utilized those funds. Okay. And so we're hoping that this will be a, you know, a good report. Um, one thing to note that if, you're, if you've been listening to any of our education budget committees, you know, the ESSER 2 and 3 that were appropriated through House Bill 630 and 632, there were various buckets or categories that the legislator wanted the districts or OPI to, to allocate those funds out. And so we had to create what they call a consolidated, consolidated application. So for that, that first school of Zorky, under that ESSER 2 consolidated, there's actually various funding buckets. And so, you know, if anybody wanted to get down to another level of detail, you know, reach out to OPI, our staff here, we can provide you. But um, we're hoping that this gives some just immediate information for um, for the folks that are out there looking. The second report that we're going to we're sending out monthly is a, a direct report to the Board of Trustees. And that'll really look similar to that first page on this this document that for those school districts in that county, um, what those schools did again individually and what their status is with the, the three buckets of the money, ESSER 1, 2, and 3. And our intention with that is, is to make sure that for full transparency, superintendent want to make sure that the board of trustees were aware of where the schools were with the spend of their money. Um, so that as they have their conversation, conversations about how to best utilize that, or if there's that need to actually do an amendment like Wendy had um, spoke to earlier, that they can have that conversation. They have relevant and accurate data that they can use to make those decisions. Um, the third piece I'll touch on is, again, the timing of, of, the, of the grants. Again, we know that ESSER 1 is coming up here quickly, that the final date to obligate those funds is going to be September 30th of this month. Um, as a reminder, an obligation means that that school district has, has to have a valid expenditure on or before September 30th. And then the Department of Education and OPI provide what they call a liquidation period, where the school districts have um, about a month and a half to finalize their accounting and to draw down any of those remaining balances. And so for that, you know, 1.6 million we have left of ESSER, the school districts are submitting cash requests as we speak. Um, that, that first, the September window will close on the 25th, which will, OPI will make our regular payment out on October 10th. And then the school districts will have another opportunity through October 25th to submit another round of cash requests for um, reimbursement in November. And then there's one last final third opportunity for them to liquidate their funds. And um, they have to submit what they call a final expenditure report, which pretty much closes out their grant. So if there's any reimbursements they missed in that, the September or the October um, cash draws, and again, they have that last mm -hmm. opportunity on November 10th. So um, post November 10th, we're hoping we'll have some finalized numbers of how much ESSER 1 we've expended. Um, to be fully transparent, we do um, anticipate there'll be a small amount that will revert back to the Department of Education. You know, as much as we can work with the school districts, we can't make them spend the money. And, you know, honestly, we want them to be, um, you know, accountable for the funds. They're not just misusing, misusing it. So if they have something they revert back, that's actually not a bad thing. So, mm -hmm. but again, I think for the, 
the states across the nation, you know, Montana is doing very well. Our schools have done very well. And so I think we're in a good position. If an um, understanding uh, what I received about a week ago, if we look at it and from a national view, about 12% of all the three buckets of dollars nationwide has been um, expended, uh, expended. Montana has expended 27% of all of the dollars. So we are double in the, the timing and in all of the money of the expenditures. And even when we do look at other states, some states have not even allocated the money yet to schools. I'll repeat that. Some schools have not even received an allocation if they're in another state. I'm so proud that Montana was one of the very first states to allocate ESSER 1. And we did that immediately, wanting to make sure that schools had the opportunity to respond to the virus. And if we can all remember what, what uh, from March until July of 2020 was, there was so much uh, unknown that was around in our communities and even with our health communities of not knowing where we are. So Montana's come a long way. We're very excited about the opportunity of the data share. That is one of the things that Wendy and Rebecca from our team in communicating and having relationships with our school districts over these very precious dollars. So any questions you might have of Jay or Wendy regarding anything dealing with ESSER 1, 2, or 3. Thank you. We'll move on then to the next. And, and Brian, if you want to go ahead and stick up the agenda, that would be perfect. I've got Jay still here. And Victoria, good morning. Discussing morning, the broadband. And if you could share about what you participated this last week in with a company that the Department of Administration has hired to do um, a survey of uh, individuals across our state. If you could share, Victoria. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, just to touch on a little bit of what we did last week, um, we actually met with a group called Summit Consulting. They have been contracted with the Department of Administration to um, assist in the data collection efforts for broadband. Um, so I, I don't know if I can screen share. I'm going to try. Let's see if this will let me. Um, basically, uh, it looks like it, it will not let me screen share. So um, I apologize for that. Right now, Victoria. Yep. Okay, so let's see. If you look at the OPI website, I'm not sure, Brian, if you're able to pull that up. Um, I just kind of wanted to reference uh, some information that we've added to the OPI website. Thank you all for being patient. Okay, perfect. So if we go to the home page on the OPI, just the main uh, the main page for the OPI site. I believe that's the ESSER page. Yes, so um, you can see here what we've done is actually added a menu option at the bottom there for broadband. Um, if you could please click that. Thank you. And then so here we're actually updating uh, anything related to broadband. Uh, so this is going to be kind of like a communication portal for us. Um, you'll see there uh, the public town hall option was actually the event that was hosted by the uh, consulting firm Summit Consulting. Um, so they did host uh, a variety of events across the state, um, collecting information from citizens. They held a public town hall session in the morning uh, in quite a few different cities across the state. Um, and also they have a survey that is going out. Uh, we actually added the menu option on the OPI website there. If you look at the bottom, the Montana resident survey, that one is actually uh, the survey that was created by the consulting firm and collaborating with the Department of Administration. 
Um, this survey has two different options. The first option on the left hand side there with that QR code gives an option for uh, any Montana resident that can take that survey. Um, what they're doing is um, pursuing data collection efforts to coll collect more information on the broadband status across the state. Um, and the survey on the right-hand side of that uh, flyer is specific to any representatives uh, for, for across the state of Montana that serve communities like OPI, for example, uh, serving the schools. So that survey is specific to um, that population as well. And if you go back to the OPI website, we actually have a broadband survey for schools, that second menu option there. And we're hoping that um, people will utilize that to um, answer a couple of questions. It's, it's a very short survey. It's two questions there. And we just want to get a little more information on the broadband status out there at the school level. Um, so those are the two efforts that we're working and focusing on right now. And I believe the consulting firm is working with the D of A. And we're also looking to collaborate with them in the future. I believe they had mentioned um, additional um, in-person sessions across the state will be held next month sometime in October. So we'll, we'll certainly update that as we get that information from them. And Victoria, this is Jay, I'm just gonna add one quick thing. You know, as, as we, these surveys are available for the school districts, you know, the, as much as we can partner together to really get the word out that that 300 to 500 million dollars is available um it's it's really going to be a, a great benefit to the schools you know the first round of the infrastructure funding that came through the dva um, did the applications i think they did a good job identifying needs out there um, but i'd say that this this pot of money has a little bit more flexibility you know one of the things if you look at the maps of the where that fund that initial infrastructure money went you know, portions of our eastern half of the state really are, are not going to be served as well as what, I mean, personally, I think that they should. So, I mean, if as much as we can get our eastern half of our states to those rural schools, that really connectivity is an issue, you know, their voice is going to be absolutely critical in this process to make sure that, you know, if they have those needs, that we can identify them through this survey process, and then we can make sure that they get the resources needed to ensure that they can, you know, keep those connectivities up for their students and for their teachers. Um, so just wanted to touch base on that, that as much as we can, if we, you guys can help us get that word out there. Um, again, this is such a great benefit for schools that we just want to make sure that our state gets served as, as much as possible. Excellent. And it has gone out in the compass and will go out again. Uh, it's exceedingly important, as Jay said, that education is at the table and that our state has an equal opportunity to make sure that education in any width of uh, broadband has an opportunity. I know our libraries are at the table, our, our county, our city libraries, and we need to make sure that all of literacy is available, whether it's numeracy or whether it's literacy, however it might be, any format of education needs to be at the table. So we're asking that you include this in your newsletters. We're asking that you include this. Um, you can come to this website or the Department of Admin also has one. The information will go out um, after we conclude our discussion today. And if you have any further questions at all, uh, Victoria is also here and we'll send her information if you have any questions. So it is about our future and it's going to take some time to make sure that we get this thing all across. But if education's not at the table in the beginning, it's gonna be very challenging at the end. So thank you all for listening to that. Any questions you might have on broadband? Wonderful, let's go to the next one. Thank you, Brian. Dr. Mergel. We have got the opportunity to talk about 55 as well as uh, 58. Thank you, Superintendent. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Excellent. I'm going to share my screen.
We will be sure to share this with you um, after the meeting. Brian will send this out to you, but we just wanted to provide you today an update on two chapters that are currently under revision. The first one is Chapter 58, Educator Preparation Program Standards. These are the standards that are used to accredit our teacher preparation programs at our 10 universities in the state of Montana. So this adoption timeline and the work uh, for chapter 58 started back in November of 2021. And the yellow is the place that we're at right now. Last week, the Board of Public Ed did meet uh, to review the considerations and the comments and responses from the public comment period that closed. Um, and so they will be on November 17th and 18th in their next Board of Public Ed meeting, working on that to publish the adoption notice and make any final uh, changes to Chapter 58 at that time. I've included in here a summary of the different components that went forward, uh, uh, recommendations from our superintendent for these um, standards that include things such as like expanding and emphasizing uh, the clinical experiences that our teacher uh, candidates receive. So being sure that they have a diverse opportunity to be in practicums and student teaching and really getting that opportunity to connect uh, the practice with the theory that they're learning in the classroom and really allowing more flexibility for them where possible to be able to, to decide where they want to do their clinical experiences, which might be in a community where they really would like to um, potentially become a teacher full time. Um, there's some pieces in there recognizing the tribal language and culture. There's some really big emphasis on um, how uh, the universities use data to continue to really um, improve their programs, how they are ensuring that they're supporting those initial candidates from recruitment to completion when they complete that. Um, there was an added endorsement for English language development that was recommended that was separated out from world language. And speaking of world language, American Sign Language was recommended to be added within that component. Um, there was a renaming of the endorsement title for students with disabilities um, uh, and changing that to be special education. Um, and then there was really a lot of work that was done to be sure that all of the endorsement areas are current and up to date um, and are um, the ones that they're using to really prepare their teachers for all of those different areas. And so there's um, uh, those are kind of the components that came in within the superintendent's recommendations. After the review of, of the public comments, the Board of Public Ed had about four items that they're still working on that they will be uh, finishing and bringing forward in their November meeting. One is the title for industrial trades and technology education. There's lots of different um, names that that does go by from industrial technology mm -hmm. to um, industrial uh, technology. And, um, and so there's a big <laughs> conversation happening about what really should it be called. So uh, that's kind of up in the air. Uh, just some uh, formatting and some layout of the reading specialist uh, language endorsement. Uh, and then there was some um, additional recommendations on the advanced standards for the endorsement areas for principal and superintendent that the board wants to take a look at. And then there was some conversation and some things around the definition and use of the term equity. So these are kind of four areas uh, that the board will still be working on in the next few months as they get to November um, that they'll be sharing there. So um, I'm going to stand for any questions that you might have about 58 before I share my screen for 55. Julie, I did just want to make one clarification on the timeline that was listed there. It showed that the board would ultimately adopt in November, and that is not the case. Um, the board actually won't be adopting until January. It also says on there that the effective date is going to be in January. And as we've all discussed, the effective date is actually not until July. So I will be bringing um, to the board an a alternate um, timeline for them to approve just so that we're all on the same page as we continue the work for Chapter 58. Thank you, McCall. So in November, they will be though still working on this and have a portion of their meeting about, about this component. 
Correct. So as you mentioned, there are still several areas um, that the board is working on. Um, since there was that legislation that said you, boards can't adopt rules in the last quarter of a legislative session, we actually have another meeting to be working on this. So the board can't adopt until January anyways. So we are going to come back to the table in November and continue working on those. Um, you said four, I think there's like six or seven areas um, where there may need to be a little bit more work. Thank you, Director Flynn. Um, moving on to chapter 55, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. So chapter 55 is the accreditation standards for K through 12. Um, and so uh, we've been working on chapter 55 since September of 2020. Um, we've had <laughs> two groups that worked um, and the superintendent uh, put together a negotiated rulemaking committee. Um, she sent uh, her recommendations to that committee and that committee deliberated um, to reach consensus on 98% of those recommendations. And so so um, uh, we have kind of, we're moving down the process. There are four different documents that have been forwarded to the Board of Public Education around the proposed rule changes for Chapter 55, as well as the notice and the economic impact statement, which is required as part of negotiated rulemaking for Chapter 55. But in the last board meeting, just recently last week, the board did finalize the timeline for chapter 55. So I wanted to share that. Um, and so where we're at right now in the process is they just, um, and we're working on publishing the notice so that it can go into the Secretary of State's um, rulemaking process. So that proposal notice will go to the Secretary on um, September 27th. Um, and then it'll be open for public comment starting on October 7th. There will be a public hearing on October 31st regarding Chapter 55. And then final written comment will close on November 4th for Chapter 55. Um, and then there will be a um, the, the Board of Public Ed will be um, sending to the um, Ed Interim Budget Committee, a draft notice um, and the economic impact statement before November 7th, at, um, so that they have that a month in advance at the, for their interim committee meeting on December 7th, where they'll um, consider that economic impact statement. Um, the board will be working on and reviewing all of the public comments that they receive up through uh, November 4th at their November 17th and 18th meeting. Um, and there's some dates as it continues to move forward um, into January with the, the um, effective dates of the rules going into place on July 2023. Um, McCall, was there anything you wanted to add about that timeline in terms of where we're at in the process with chapter 55. I do not. Thanks, Dr. Merkel. <laughs> Thanks. Um, there is a little bit in here about the economic impact statement um, that is required under statute for the negotiated rulemaking. Um, and so there were surveys that were sent out for these um, different rules. And of the, all the rules that were considered, um, the negotiated rulemaking committee decided that they wanted to put 14 on a survey. The superintendent put the last one, the 15th, on one for uh, school counseling. And so this is the amount of surveys that came back. We had quite a bit more respondents than we normally have. Um, when you look at that economic impact survey, really um, the major portion of who responded to that survey is from three major groups. That would be our school administrators, our school teachers and staff, and our clerks. And so we did have some other folks that did participate in that survey, but um, predominantly of these responses, those are the folks who did respond. Um, what we have, uh, looking at the data and the responses from those surveys, what it's indicating right now is that there's no indication that the proposed rule change changes would create a significant economic impact for districts and students, uh, schools. So that's kind of where we're at on that. Um, 
I do have in here a summary chart. Like I said, Brian, we'll be sending this to you of the number of rules that were considered by the negotiated rulemaking committee. There were five new, there were 14 where there was no changes. There was a full consensus on 48, and then there was one that was unresolved where the superintendent adopted the language of which they agreed upon up to that point. Um, but I want to spend some time just really quickly while we have a few minutes talking a little bit about Chapter 55 and the proficiency-based learning model. Um, you will see within the recommendations um, and within that work that that negotiated rulemaking committee did based upon the superintendent's recommendations, there's quite a bit of shifting Chapter 55 on a quality education what we mean by that is how do we really start to infuse a performance, a proficiency based learning model within there? And so you will see that showing up quite a bit and quite a bit of shift to say a quality system really starts to to shift from a traditional model to a proficiency based model. So I wanted to kind of share with you where those those pieces are showing up within the rule. Um, so within the first chapter, um, one through five. Uh, chapters are um, repealed. So the first actual chapter that starts is in the 600s. Um, there's a piece in there called um, an integrated action plan. So it's really taking a look at remodeling the continuous school improvement plan to say, really, how are you setting a graduate profile? What's the collective vision of the community of what it means to graduate your students and graduate your students ready? What are the skills that you want them to have um, to be successful? Is that some workplace you know, competencies? Is it some academic skills? Which are the pieces that you really want to be sure that every student walks away with what those skills are? And then it starts to really outline then what are the components of your plan and the strategies and the goals of how you're really going to achieve that graduate profile through a learner centered system. So you'll see that show up in um, in that integrated action plan which is pr pretty big difference between currently how we have schools share how they're accountable. They currently do a team's report where they go in and check, do we have this policy in place? Yes or no? Um, is Do you have the assessment plan, for example? Yes or no? And they check. Versus in the integrated action plan, it's taking all of that and bringing that together to say, really describe to us what your learning models are um, that are going to help drive towards your graduate profile. It has components on there that talk about how are you going to um, create an assessment plan? What is it? Describe your assessment plan that's helping you measure the growth and the progression and the proficiency of your students as they start to move towards um, obtaining those skills that you want them to have. So there's a, a big shift within that integrated action plan that's really integrating all of that. So for example, we're not just saying, do you have a family engagement um, strat policy that you're implementing? Check like in teams. The shift here in these recommendations is to say, we know that quality schools have really strong family and community components built in and involvement in the process. So what does that really look like for them to really be involved? And so now it's a standard to say, if you're a quality school, you have a good family and community engagement strategy. And so in the integrated action plan, you would describe what is your family and community engagement strategy? What are you doing um, to meet this standard versus just checking that it's a policy that you have? So I just wanted to kind of emphasize that's a place where we really see this learner-centered system that's kind of based upon a graduate profile and everything leading up to that. Um, you'll see in the definitions in 1055-602 in those recommendations, a lot of, of um, new definitions that really do focus on um, a learner-centered system that really is about a proficiency-based model about growth and progression and multiple measures. So there's a good piece here to kind of take a look at. I'm going to kind of scroll through those definitions really quick. Um, 
Within 603, this is really about curriculum and assessment. Um, there's some pieces in here that are really encouraging multiple measures to really be measuring student learning along progressions and growth and proficiency um, and really finding multiple ways to do that. Because if you're using a proficiency based model, you want to know where your kids are, are, are at, how they're growing, when they're growing, so that you can really be sure that that learning becomes at the level that they're at and moving through and, and demonstrating their proficiency um, in not based upon a grade level or a time or seat time, but rather upon really their demonstration of um, obtaining those skills and being able to, to apply them. Um, so that's within 603. And again, this assessment plan that I referenced up in the integrated action plan is also laid out in 603 in the assessment component of saying, what really do you have, a, have an assessment plan to really be measuring uh, your proficiency based um, model? Um, we go into 701. This is the, the part that has really the uh, local board of trustees policies. And so this has really um, made a shift to, you need to have all of those policies, but part of your strategic plan as a local board is to really uh, have one plan that's lined to that graduate profile. And that really the policies that you have are around these major areas to provide for safety and well-being, emphasize student learning and student growth, allow for personalized and proficiency-based learning and other policies for effective operation. Of course, there are the policies that they have to follow that are state and federal, but these are the ones in particular. But I just wanna emphasize, look at that change there that's being recommended in B and C on local policies, rather than saying you have to have a policy for family and community engagement, you have to have a policy for this. It's saying, hey, your policies also need to have some things that are emphasizing that student learning and growth and a, and a proficiency based model because many of our districts have declared proficiency but really being sure that they've operationalized that to say what does that really mean when you say that you have declared proficiency so how are you really outlining that so that it, um, you have policies to implement that um, there's a piece in 1055-703 of really expanding the role of the principal to really be um, an instructional leader, um, to be really allowing for that personalized and professional-based learning model. So it's also in there as to what, what is the role of the principal in a proficiency-based model. Um, you'll see it show up in 714 on professional development. Um, there's a piece in there that's really talking about aligning to your district graduate profile. So, so a lot of parts in that professional development that are really pushing towards improving learner outcomes and really thinking of that shift of what's required to, to shift to a proficiency-based model within professional development. Um, the piece around family and community engagement, we talked about that a little bit, that um, that's pieces in there and, and aligned to the integrated action plan. There's a piece on school climate. We know that um, quality schools have good school climate. And so there's a piece adding in there about an assessment uh, and a survey of measuring school climate so that schools are continuing to respond and gather feedback so that they're um, improving their school climate um, based upon the responses and feedback that they're getting from all their stakeholders. Um, 803 is really on learner access. This is a really, I, I think, a wonderful standard. I challenge you to take a look at this one because it does talk about what really do students need to have for their opportunity to meet that full Montana constitution um, where they have equal opportunities to really fulfill and be provided their full potential. So lots of things in here about students engaged in authentic learning, given that equal opportunity, um, how we're really helping them um, in more of a proficiency-based model, a learner-centered model. Um, and so that's got a lot of really good components in it. Um, and so I just, you know, I, I think that that's really um, important. And then the last piece that I just want to share with you, I think is in the 900s. Um, you'll see some pieces in here where we've really emphasized that flexibility of that learner-centered system. Um, and so uh, this is where the graduation requirements are. So it talks about the required units may be satisfied by an equivalent course that meets the district's curriculum and assessment that's aligned with the standards. So really um, emphasizing that students can, uh, through a proficiency-based model, demonstrate and earn those units or those credits towards graduation um, in some equivalent course 
courses. So um, that's really emphasizing that there are those flexibilities in there, but we really wanted to be sure that that's a, a highlight at the top of those um, components there. Um, I would say that there's also some pieces um, uh, within those new graduation requirements that I think are kind of exciting, a requirement around government and civics embedded into the social studies requirements, and then personal finance as well is a piece that's within those that is a, a part of some flexibility to include it within the math um, opportunities, the, the CTE opportunities, or within social studies under economics. So um, it's not additional credits. It's saying within those 20, um, being sure that students get a half a unit of civics and government and a half a unit of personal finance and economics. So I just really um, wanted to share with you that there's a lot of places within these recommendations that have come forward um, that are now open, uh, soon to be open <laughs> for public comments. So really go in. I encourage you to take a look at some of these other areas within the integrated action plan, that graduate profile, um, those additional standards that are coming in, uh, looking at the graduation requirements and really kind of the shift to that proficiency-based model, um, as you'll see it thread throughout this entire chapter as we think about um, what makes for a quality school and, and how and in what way we're going to hold schools accountable for that. So I've done a lot of talking, but you'll get this document. I just wanted to give you kind of that overview, but I stand for any questions that you might have. Mr. White. Good morning, uh, doctor. Two questions. One is, um, are, is this going to be, is Brian going to send this document out for uh, everybody to uh, have a copy of like a PDF? And then the second question is, um, these are, are these to be approved like in the next meeting or when would these take uh, take effect? Thanks. Thank you, Steve. So yes, and uh, so yes to your first question. Um, Brian will be sending this document out to you as soon as we get done with the meeting. So you can take a look at where that proficiency-based component is thread through. Um, you'll probably wanna cross-reference it with the, um, the recommendations or the red line version or the black line version. So you can see, I did not include in this document, right? The whole recommendation of the actual verbiage of the rule change. And so when you open up that document, Steve, that um, Brian will share, there's a blue, um, there's blue links, live links, so that you can take this document and line it up with what those recommendations are so you can see um, where these pieces are and what it looks like um, in those recommendations. Um, and then I would say, Steve, with the next important piece is what the board will be doing in there um, right now is um, September, what did I say, the 27th? I have to go back on the timeline. On September 27th, they'll be published um, for the rulemaking process to begin. And so that means then starting on um, October 7th, um, they get published for people to begin making public comments. So where they're at right now is um, it's an opportunity for everybody to begin to review these recommendations and submit public comment or attend the public hearing on October 31st. So that's really the next step of where, where the process is at. Um, I hope that helps. You know, no, that really does. And the, my interest is that part of 20-5-109 uh, for homeschools and private schools in the state that we're all um, required to provide an organized course of study, which uh, in the chapter 55 uh, and especially the 900 area, there's a um, there that that's where that is all dealt with. And so there even though this is a public school issue, there's a, a bit of uh, connection to not just home schools, but private schools across the state for the organized course study. So if that is being tweaked or changed and like, you know, personal finance and, and that types, those types of things, those would be the things that need to be passed on to uh, those in the non-public school arena. 
Absolutely. So, um, Steve, what I would say to you, if you want to really check that out, be sure you look at both the program offerings. That's what um, they would be required to offer, as well as the graduation requirements. So you'd be looking at 1055, 904, and 905. Yes, correct. Thank you. Thank you. Any other further questions for Dr. Mervil as we move this process? I know I gave the Board of Public Ed on July 12th the recommendations from the Negotiating Rulemaking Committee. Uh, they reached consensus. I did not change anything within what the uh, Negotiating Rulemaking Committee had reached consensus on and then passed this on to the board. There was the one that dealt with ratios and counselors. And one of the things, Dr. Mergel, if you could please just uh, emphasize that plan uh, more so than just on checking the box of a percentage of an adult, what we are seeking in career development as well as uh, student wellness, if you could, Julie. Yeah, give me one second and I'll pull that up for you, Superintendent. Thank you. And while she's doing that, it's all about implementation and how this is going to work. That plan will be progressed through the Board of Public Ed as well. In my mind, instead of annually accrediting schools with a check the box that comes to the team's report, as Julie had said, we're looking at a longer period of three years, quite possibly in statute, it can go up to five years to have a school accredited. That also means then that instead of looking at um, where we are right now with student proficiency at being at 15% and all the others being checked the box of being accredited, we are looking at accreditation with distinction. We're looking at honoring schools that go above and beyond to really implement a learning program and a wellness program to make sure that students are embraced 100%. Julie, you've got it up, let's share. Thank you, Superintendent. So uh, this is the language that's being proposed, uh, that has been proposed for school counseling. So what you'll see here is a really uh, a shift, if you will, to, um, I'm just gonna highlight up here, um, what you'll see right there, um, this is a shift to saying every school must have a program and a program that leads to student outcomes. And what are those student outcomes that we wanna see from a school counseling program. So this is really emphasizing that you have to put, you have to have as part of your accreditation standards, a quality counseling program. So what does that mean? Well, that means what are the outcomes that you're looking for? And so that's, it's about kids then getting the knowledge and skills uh, that address mental health, safety and well-being, academic success, college and career readiness, and developing the mindsets and behaviors. Um, and so those pieces is really saying, we, we want to be sure that you are implementing a program. And so how you staff this program, there's some flexibilities that the local board of trustees um, have to be able to, to meet that need. Um, and so if every student is going to have access to a counseling program that's going to really meet those outcomes for students, how do you then um, staff it? And so then there's some options here. Um, employ licensed school counselors, contract them using a consortium or other cooperative method uh, to really have those licensed school counselors. Um, and then there's a third piece that I want to share with you is that based upon the stu school's need and school populations, a piece that's going to be required is that the superintendent recommend to the board of trustees any additional staff not to supplant but to supplement the school counseling staff to say what additional degreed license or credentialed staff are needed to support the staffing levels for you to reach and be able to implement that counseling program that results in those student outcomes that we've talked about. And so there's a really, there's a focus here in this recommendation about that program of staffing the program to meet the needs so that that becomes uh, something that is a result of student outcomes. Um, and really trying to take a look at that to say and provide that flexibility at the local level to say, what really are your unique needs in your school and in your community um, that, and what does it take for you to, to reach those full implementation effectively of that program? I hope that helps superintendent. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Myrtle. Any questions you might have on what we are asking of the board throughout this? I just want to double down on this last one, that it is never replacing a school counselor. What it is, it is, it is making sure that there is a plan in utilizing school counselors for student well-being as well as career development and wanting to have that being very plainly stated. Any further questions you might have of Dr. Mergel regarding 55 or 58? And I, again, I applaud the uh, work that we have, the homework, I should say, that we've given the Board of Public Ed within Chapter 57, which was licensing, as well as 58 teacher prep programs, and now with uh, school accreditation. So it is, a, it is a big heavy lift, and we're very appreciative. Thank you, McCall. Okay, I started the discussion uh, talking about the Universal Screening Pilot Program. Megan was not available to come today to ours. What she did share, though, in an email, that they are holding a public meeting today to score the different vendors for this Universal Screening uh, Pilot Program, that they are going to engage in a demonstration with the proposals next week, and that they should have a selection uh, at the end of next week with more information on how schools can participate. And I do want to applaud our schools because I know uh, that there are many screening tools that are uh, being utilized at this time in our public schools. Uh, this would be something that the state would offer through a grant, and a, it would be a partnership with the Office of Public Instruction and DPHHS. It, more information will follow when we have uh, more coming from DPHHS. Any questions you might have on this universal screening pilot program? Thank you. Any questions you might have over anything that we are working through? I appreciate our partnership, and I know we've had um, a long discussion today. Sometimes these meetings don't last quite a half hour. So thank you for being part of understanding that um, change in public education does not come easy. It comes when it's very mindful and meaningful with all of our partners at the table. Thank you so much. Blessings to all. Stay well.